what I really like to do is uh, uh, I don't want to go in super fast express like I usually do. I'd like to take it a little slow. So I want us to look into the Bible. For those of you who know a little bit of Hebrew, it's going to benefit you. For those of you who don't know Hebrew, challenge you. Let's learn Hebrew together. Okay? Why? You know why? Because when, when Hashem and Yeshua comes, He's going to speak in Hebrew. So before everybody knows, the faster you learn, you know, so it's easier. So let's learn it together, okay? So uh, we, uh, for those of you who are following the Torah portion, we are following the portion called Balak. And the chapters which we are really focusing on is basically Numbers chapter 22 uh, through 25. Uh, this portion is uh, very interesting compared to last week's portion. If you remember last week's portion was called Pasha Kuka. The word Kuka basically means uh, statues. Statues basically, well, what do you mean by statues? Basically, these are instructions in the Bible which uh, nobody knows why these instructions are given. And basically, when you see these instructions, you just do it. That's what God said. You know, like one of the instructions was the instruction of the red heifer. Till today, nobody knows what was the purpose of the red heifer. But don't worry, when Yeshua comes, he will teach us all. So until then, we just do. You know, what, what, what was the covenant? The covenant was we will do and we will hear. Yeah, that's it. So the idea is just to do. So like the other instruction last week was about the bronze serpent. Now, how funny it was, you know, there is the plague of serpents and you look at the bronze serpent and then only, I mean, in our common mind, you know, it doesn't actually make sense. But God said, you just do. And then last week also we talked about the waters of strife what is the waters of strife what is the hebrew name or english name meribah and merivah so this portion of numbers chapter 22 in the hebrew bible begins in verse number two in english does it begin in verse number two or verse number one i forgot to check the english bible sorry verse number two okay so in verse number one of chapter 22 of numbers it is the ending of last week's portion and you know what i don't know if you have read it it's 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 actually a very very strange ending there's a lot of interesting stuff happening this week you know usually in uh, every torah portion there is a subject of mitzvot mitzvot is uh, translated as commandments but uh, not exactly commandments it's, it's good works. It's, it's basically good works. So every portion has something that you and I can do. There is a good work. And even though we may find many of the commandments in the book of Exodus or later on in Exodus, we find in the portions of Mishpatim, in the portions of Teruma, in the portions of Tetzaveh, we see different instructions. Basically, it's all found in the book of Exodus where we can do something. Leviticus basically talks about all the priestly commandments, all what the Kohenim was supposed to do. However, here in this Pasha, Pasha Balak, basically chapter 22 through 25, you know what? There is no mitzvah in it. This is really amazing. There is no good work, none. There is nothing at all. There is not even one single commandment in, in these portions. And, and the amazing part is that this Pasha is named after a false king with a false prophet, Bila. Yeah. False king was basically Balak. And it is, it is very, it is a pretty much recorded in, in the transaction, basically what is happening here. We read about the transaction between the Jewish people and the people of Moab, the Moabites and eventually the Midianites as well. And it's kind of strange that in this portion that there is no mitzvah, there is no commandment, there is no nothing that you and I can basically do. But the question we need to ask in the beginning is then, what is the purpose of this portion actually being in the Torah? What, wh why is this whole section there in the Torah? Or what are we supposed to gain? Or what are we supposed to glean or learn from it? And the answer is, we can learn a lot. Okay? That's true because everything I believe in the Bible is not there by accident. 
from Genesis to Revelation. If you look, uh, let's turn to Numbers chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. And Moab was very afraid of the people because they were men, and Moab was distressed because of the people of Israel. Now, we, we find something unique here and strange at the same time. It was too, it begins by saying, Vayavar Balak, and Balak, the son of Zippor, was saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites and verse 3 basically describes the effect of what was being seen. Verse 3, what is he saying? He's saying, and Moab was very afraid of the people because they were many. And then he goes on to say, and Moab was distressed, but the word distress is actually a wrong word. The Hebrew basically says that Moab was disgusted. Or in other words, he despised the Jewish people. I mean, now you might think, you know, it's really great to uh, learn from Jewish people. It's great when you don't see them. <laughs> when you see them face to face and you begin to learn from them, you need to see your own responses within yourself. As Indians, we won't even show it. But inside, something else happens. And when that something else happens, you know what? You really begin to get to know the truth of your own heart. In other words, in simple English, it has the traces of anti-Semitism. It's basically how I respond to a Jew. Let it be secular or let it be spiritual. Either way, how do I respond? Because why I'm telling you is because when Yeshua comes, he's not coming back as an Indian or an American. He's coming as a Jew. So how am I going to respond to a Jew is going to be the, almost the same reaction when Yeshua comes. He is a Jew. No question in that. Yes, our interaction now really exposes any roots of anti-Semitism within us. Because we don't like the way they talk, we don't like the way they dress, we don't like the way they behave. We don't like it. And I mean, it's nice if you don't see them. I mean, some people say, Pastor, you are like, okay, I'm like this, okay, some people like me, some people doesn't like me, it doesn't matter. But if you see a real Jew, I want to see how, because... They will look at you and tell you black for black and white for white. They won't mince words. And this, this is exactly what's happening. Here when the Bible says that Moab became disgusted, he despised the Jewish people. This is what it really means. I mean, the two verses, these two verses are really, really very interesting. Because in the English, what's so great about it? Nothing so great about it in the English. But the Hebrew reads or begs a lot of questions. The question is, why does the Torah say in verse number two, Balak saw? Can we put the Hebrew and the English if it's possible? Now see, uh, it's very, I know it's, uh, can we zoom in to verse number uh, two? Can you see it? Yes. <coughs> Perfect. Now, you, now, those of you who don't, can't read the Hebrew, don't worry about it. But those of you who know a little bit of Hebrew, look at, look at, look at it with me. It, 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 verse number two begins by saying, Vayavar Balak, Ben Zippor, Et Kol Hasher, Israel La Imori, and Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. The question we need to ask, why does the Torah say he saw versus Balak heard? For example, we are living in Hyderabad. We, we've heard, some of us have seen the borders of India. 
Yes? Or oh, some of us at least know the picture of the borders. Or oh, some of us have... Uh, we, we know what I'm talking about. Now, there is a group of people who crossed our borders. We are hearing it. And next day we are coming and we are telling, you know, I heard. You know, I heard something like this happen. But how can we see something what we heard? But here the Bible, the Torah does not say he heard. Because he was not there. But yet the Torah is saying that he saw. I mean, the question is, 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 is this a figure of expression? Is the Torah trying to teach us something? Now, for example, let's turn to Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. It's, it, if you, those of you don't know, it is the time where uh, the ten sayings or the ten commandments like we call it. It's not commandments in Hebrew, it's ten sayings. See what it says over there. Ten, uh, uh, Exodus 19, 16 says, And it came to pass on the third day, there were what? What does your Bible say? What does your Bible say in English? Thundering, thundering. But do you know the Hebrew word for thundering over there? It is kolot. And the word kolot does not mean thundering. It basically means voices. It is the plural form of the Hebrew word kol. Basically, so basically here, yeah, I mean, this is amazing. Third day, they heard voices they were thundering in other words you know what the sages say Hashem changed the frequency of the optic nerve of the Jewish people that where their souls were seeing things in a wave pattern and which is very really interesting their, their eyes began to see the voice of God or the voices of God. That's what it literally says. I mean, I mean, for us, it, it's really difficult for us to comprehend. But it makes sense to us in our day and age. Why? Because uh, we're living in a day or an age of microwaves, radio waves, Wi-Fi frequency. Now just think, we know there is Wi-Fi frequency here. We know there are waves around. But what if we can see them? Jewish people saw the voices that was there on Mount Sinai. Amazing. I mean, if our eyes were to see this, you know, the Woodstock would be nothing compared. For those of you who know what Woodstock is. Now, here Numbers 22 two says, saw, Balak saw, instead of heard. Now, the next question we need to ask is, are you all with me? Yes. I'm, ask, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Is that fine? Yes. I know you're not used to, but we're going to learn to be used to, okay? This is how Yeshua is also going to teach, I believe. So, the next question we need to ask is, why the Torah says, Balak, the son of Zippor? I mean, I mean, in many cases, when the Torah introduces non-Jewish people, people especially non-jewish leaders it never mentions the name of a person's father nor their mother in most of the cases have you ever read of it i mean in fact we find this information not only found in the talmud but also in the case of genealogies of someone if you want to find somebody genealogy the Bible the Torah that the Bible does not talk about it but if we go to the Talmud it basically gives us the genealogies of these people for example where do we find Haman's genealogy from Ge Haman's genealogy can be traced back to Ag and the giant kings how do we find that it's not there in the Bible it's it's basically the, the, the Talmud basically talks about it so if the Talmud records most of the lines, some of the wicked kings that reigns. However, the Torah and the Tanakh does not make a mention of these lines. So it is interesting to note that the Torah wants to introduce something. And he tells us that Balak was the son of Zippor. For example, if we look into last week's portion. Numbers 21-21. Just turn to your Bibles. 
It says that when Israel advanced against Sihon, king of the Amorites. Ravi Shastri, read it. Read it. What does it say? Numbers 21, 21. Yeah, that's it. It says, he sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying. I mean, here it does not mention his father's name. It does not mention his mother's name. It, it, it is not interested. In, in other words, whenever the Bible gives a genealogy, it is more interested to the Jewish people. Not much, doesn't want to give us record of the enemies of the Jewish people or their Gentile neighbors. I'm not interested in knowing about that. But, but another, I mean, this is really interesting. Another question to ask is the way the Torah describes the reaction after Balak saw. So that's one question to ask. Why is the Torah mentioning that he was the son of Zippor? Another question we need to ask is, is his reaction. It even titles the Jewish people as two ways in verse number three. In verse number 3, it mentions the Jewish people first as Am, and then it mentions the Jewish people as Bene Israel. Hello, Bene Israel, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. The Torah describes two distinct, you see that over there? Yes. It's, it uses the word Am, and then it uses the word Bene Israel. Right. Why? I mean, the Torah describes two distinct reactions. By the people of Moab, when it describes, see, it says in verse number three, Vayagar Moab. Moab wa became very frightened. That is one reaction. The question is, what did they become frightened from? Then it says, Nipane Ha'am, before the face of the people. Why? Because. Me od kirav hu, for they were a great multitude. In other words, they were great people. That's the first distinction. Are you with me? Yes. The second distinction over here, a reaction is then the Bible uh, Torah says, by a courts Moab, meaning Moab became disgusted. The word courts, not just disgusted, but they are. Utterly, they, they utterly despise the Jews. Then it says, Mi pene bene Israel, because of the people of Israel. The first part of verse 3 says, Vayagar Moab mi pene ha'am. They were fearful before the people. However, it, then it says, they were disgusted. Mi pene bene Israel. I mean, it, it, it does not say they were disgusted with the people. It says they were disgusted with the people of uh, the children of Israel. Bene, Bene Israel. Uh, hello, are you with me? Yeah. I mean, once again, it changes the definition from Ha'am, people, to Bene Israel, to the children of Israel, which is a clear title describing the Jewish people. It gives little more substance of who it is actually talking about, which is really, really interesting. So the question is, why change the title from Ha'am to Bene Israel? You might ask me, Pastor, is that important? Every word. What did Yeshua say? Not one jot or tittle. Every word. That means every word in the Torah is important. In the English, we think it doesn't, but in the Hebrew, it is important. Why change the title is the question we need to ask ourselves. And why these two different distinctions? What are the two distinctions? First was via, via, via gar, second is via quotes. What's the difference here? I have asked too many questions so far. Let me try and answer it little by little, okay? To the first question. First, it says Balak saw. Verse number two says, Vaya, vaya ar balak ben zippor et kol asher Israel la imori. And below, Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. He saw. Once the Jewish people had conquered them, we can think maybe it is a figure of speech. He saw, can also be, maybe he uh, heard. 
like maybe it is interchangeable. But if we back up at the ending of last week's portion to Numbers 22 verse 1, the Torah immediately tells us that the Jewish people conquered Sihon, they conquered Keshbon, and then it tells us afterwards in Numbers 22 verse 1, so that, and the people of Israel set forward, camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan by Jericho. So basically, they were basically in Moabite territory. Uh, for those of you who don't know who the Moabites are, Moabites are basically relatives of the Jewish people. How you may ask? Through Lot. Okay? If you want to know more about that, in, an, in the next couple of months, we will restart Genesis. We will know more about that. Until then, hold your brakes. So here it says, Numbers 22, 2, say saw instead of heard. So he saw something. Then the next question we ask is, why does the Torah say Balak was the son of Zippor? Like, like I said. Did I cover that? Yeah, I covered that. So, so here they were in the banks of Jordan opposite to the J Jericho. So maybe the Torah is suggesting that maybe since they were at the banks of Jericho, on the banks of the Jordan, Balak witnessed something. Maybe he was on the hillside and maybe he could see the battle take place from a distance. I mean, he, maybe he happened to see the Jewish people conquer Keshbon. Maybe he happened to see that they killed Sihon, the king, the Amorite people. Maybe that could have triggered a fear among the Moabite people. Maybe that is what the Torah is saying. Maybe. But if we deal with Balaam, and Balak, we need to understand these two men are not regular men. These are men who practiced and have been living a lifestyle of witchcraft and sorcery. Both of them, Balak and Bilam. The reason why the Torah records Balak's father Zippor is because Zippor was not his biological father, rather Zippo refers to his spiritual father where he obtained his spiritual power from. Interesting. Here it says, Balak the son of Zippo because he was the master of bird divination. Bird divination. The Hebrew word Zippor means what? Bird. It means bird. It is the masculine form of a bird. Feminine is Zippora. Everybody with me? So it's basically saying over here that he, 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 it is saying that Balak is the son of a bird. Which bird? I mean, really. Which bird is he talking about? I mean, the question you might be wondering, I, we need to ask quickly is, what is bird divination? Bird divination is nothing but black magic. They would take a bird, they would perform certain acts, whisper spells into the bird, he would burn the incense for it, and this bird will reveal secrets to him from a spiritual realm. The bird would basically gather intel from the spiritual realm. It's like uh, the phoenix that comes back to life after death, if you know what I'm talking about. I mean, I mean, I have not, I have not seen, <laughs> I, I, I have not seen bird teleport. And I have not seen them come back to in, do intel. But what bird divination is, fusing the bird as a shell or a clipper to match up with a demon to gather intel from the spiritual realm. In other words, what they used to do in some countries and even they do sometimes in India here is that sometimes we can even use dead animals or dead cats they, where they use black magic from the cat organs and whatever what they are can also use 
is basically uh, instead of burying the human beings they would keep their body and then they would invite spirits to come into the body and through the body they would speak okay for example now I know some of you are very familiar to these things this is all witchcraft black magic have you heard of uh, about the the witch of indoor not indoor in the Bible indoor which indoor? E N D O R, not indoor. The witch of indoor. You guys don't know about it. First Samuel twenty-eight. Absolutely. How did Samuel rise from the dead? Did he appear in a ghostly figure? I mean, just depending on the person's soul, you can de determine the frequency on how they will be able to look into spiritual things. How sensitive you are to certain things. So however, how Shaul was able to communicate to Samuel, the rabbis, the, the sages thought that the body was used as a house to, to house the actual soul to come through speak. And that's how Samuel communicated to King Saul and told him basically, King Saul, what you're doing is absolutely wrong. And you know what? It's a bad thing. Are you with me? That's how divination was done. Even, for example, even in Genesis, Yosef had a cup of divination. Hello? You, you, you guys don't read your Bibles? So, pardon me? Yeah, so the question is, did he? Absolutely yes. Why? Now, for those of you who don't know, for your information, to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you actually had to be fluent in understanding witchcraft because you had to learn how to counter react those spirits. Also, you had to be uh, multi fluent in different languages because if you were a Sheliak from the Sanhedrin and you went into the lands of the diaspora, you had to know the language of that specific land. You had to be accustomed to the customs of the land. You had to be accustomed to the religion and what they believed. And basically, in other words, basically you were a full-blown professional. Not that you had to follow these, you had to know it. You had to know it. Now, I'm not telling you you should go and learn all these things, okay? So don't say tomorrow, pastor said, no, you, none of you are going to be members of the Sanhedrin. So don't, you don't have to venture into that right now. I'm just telling you the qualifications to be a, a member of the Sanhedrin. In other words, the members of the Sanhedrin were not just people who just knew the 66 books of the Bible. In fact, you know what I'm talking about. They knew way beyond stuff that, they, and yeah, they were not dummies. They, they, it took many years to become rabbis. It took many years to be learned. They were well versed in mathematics. They were well versed in science, physics, chemistry. So you think what you're studying is useless? No, no, no. All these things are useful. Yeah, they, they, none of these things they learned by themselves. They were always guided by a tutor. They had somebody to go through them. They, they didn't have Google and YouTube to learn from. They, like, like Paul had Gamaliel, yes. Are you with me? In other words, it's easy to learn everything from the YouTube, but you, if you learn from there, from Google and YouTube, you're bound to fail. The problem with many people failing is because YouTube and Google are your rabbi. Virtual rabbis are useless. You need to have a physical rabbi to help you walk. That's what discipleship is all about. Are you with me? So, so, so basically, bird, bird divination was one of them. And, the, and, and Balak was the son of Zippor because his father, his, the, his power was driven from bird divination. This is where he obtained his power from. So when he would perform witchcraft, he would see through the eyes of the bird. So depending on which spirit was fused into the bird, it would basically get information and intel. Are you with me? So therefore, when the Torah says in verse 2 that via, via Var Balak, Balak saw, it basically means that he obtained information about the Jewish people through a certain birth through which he drew his power from. 
Why, pastor, can't you just tell it simply? I don't want to make it simple. Because we're studying. This is, this, this is basically who he is. Any questions? Okay, so, see, and, and, and the thing is, you need to understand is, that not, not only was Balak well good in this, even Balaam, Bilam. What was Bilam's origins? Bilam's origin is, origin is from Aram. Anyone remember, don't tell if you know, others who don't know, what was Aram famous for? Who lived in Aram? Uncle Laban, Padan Aram. Hello? So in other words, Bilam was a descendant of Laban and why, this is why he speaks so fondly of Hashem as if he knows Hashem. <laughs> Laban, you know, he spoke, I know Hashem. I mean, he was very, he was very familiar with the, with the God of Israel. You know, we know about Laban. For those of you who don't know who Laban was, he's basically Jacob's father-in-law. Okay, they, they basically had issues with each other. So in other words, what is happening between Bilam and the Jewish people? Is a family issue which started way back during Jacob's time. So, and, and, and by the way, for the record, I also want you to know that Bilam used to be an advisor for Pharaoh. Just like Job, Yitro, all used to be advisors for Pharaoh, according to most, that's what it says. And it is, and, and they, they were the ones basically advising Pharaoh how to kill the Jewish people when they were sentencing the death sentence upon them. Basically, genocide upon the Jewish boys. So, this is what it means, verse number 2 of uh, Numbers 22, where it says, Vayavar Balak ben Zippor, and Balak the son of Zippor saw, in other words, he learned everything through a bird, everything what he did was basically black magic. Now this explains everything why as soon as he saw everything, he's the, what the Jews did at Sihon, what and the Amorites, then it says in verse number 3, it's Vayagar Moab. After he saw, he became frightened. Naturally. He saw something, he became frightened and this is really strange. Why? Why say Moab versus Moabites because Moab is a single entity here usually the Torah speaks in a singular context it usually refers to the essence of the king who represents the nations but here it's saying Balak here is known as the king of the Moabites he's also recorded to be the prince of Midian but however when the Midians joined the Moabites they made him king basically to war against the Jewish people Therefore, he basically captures the essence of the people. So, when it says, Vayagar Moab, Moab became frightened. It is saying that Moab became frightened. Why? In other words, Balak was scared to death when he saw the Jews, what the Jews were capable of. In other words, you know what was happening? He saw and he pooped in his poop. <laughs> That's what basically happens. That's what basic English. I'm sorry to use the vocabulary. That's what happened. Are you with me? So in, in other words, the Torah is not just saying that Balak was fearful because of what he saw through witchcraft. He saw them conquering. And he knew there was a power behind their conquering. But that, that, but that was not the only thing that made him power, power, fearful. Now, the Torah is very distincting, distincting about making these two reactions very, very clear. Verse number, verse number 3 says, Vayagar Moab, Moab became very frightened. And then it says, Vayakat Moab, Moab became disgusted. One was frightened and one was disgusted. Moab became frightened is one reaction. And then it says, why, why, why he became frightened? He became frightened because in, in, in before the face of the people. And after that it says, uh, Moab became disgusted, detested, despised because of the people of Israel. Are you with me? Yeah. Two distinct reactions. It has a deeper meaning. 
Because the Torah acknowledges that Balak said that this was a great people. It's the Hebrew word, Mi'od Ki Rav Hu. For they were a great multitude. If Balak saw that they were a great multitude, their strength was numerous, why does it say that he detested them? It is saying that Balak saw through the bird, he obtained some classified spiritual information about the Jewish people. He saw something in them. They had that ability to conquer. They conquered Keshbon. They conquered Sihon. And now they're sitting in his backyard. They're ready to make the move. You know, in other words, they didn't want to destroy this guy. When they were coming to his backyard, they were not come to destroy him. They were destroyed because they decided not to allow them to pass through. That was the reason. You need to understand that. They, they were not there to kill because they were relatives and God said, don't do anything to them. But they came to a point, you know, you're troubling us. Now we have to take our stand. Are you with me? It's like, we know Yeshua says, and somebody slaps you, show the other side. After that, what? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, guys. See, friends, the idea is, the idea is when it comes to protecting your family, when it comes to protecting your children, you do whatever it takes to protect them. Don't, don't, don't be there as passive and say, oh, Yeshua said, so I have to. No, no, no. If so, uh, uh, somebody comes to, 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 to rob your house or somebody comes to rape your child, don't you say, Yeshua said I should be peace. No, no, no. You, you, I, you stand in guard and say, no, I won't allow that to happen. Maybe you will die on the process, but you, you've taken your stand, not in peace, but you're fighting for your right to live as a human being. That's nothing to do with Christianity. Are you with me? Basically, you take your stand. No, I will not allow this nonsense. Why? Because... When somebody wants to do evil, it's not from God. Yep. You take your stand and say, I will not stand against it. And do whatever it takes to protect your family, your people, your nation. Yeah. Are you with me? Pardon me? Yeah. Nehemiah, when he was building the wall. What were the two things that he had? In one hand a weapon and the other hand a tool. So if somebody is going to come to kill you, destroy them before they destroy you. It's not... Yeah, it's basically... The Hebrew word for peace is what? Shalom. In, it means peace, it means completeness. But in the picture language, it basically means destroying the enemy that is connected to the chaos. You will only receive shalom when you destroy the chaos. That's what it basically means. Yeah. See, see that, that's why we don't understand it, why Israel stands up to defend themselves. It's, they have a right. It's, it's like, as Indians, if Pakistan God forbid, keeps on shooting, shooting, shooting. Do you think the Indian army is going to keep quiet and receive it? No, we won't receive it. That's all what Israel is doing. They're defending their borders. They're making sure that their people live in peace. The Muslims, the Christians, everybody can come and live with them as long as you don't fight. <coughs> live in peace. You want to follow Islam in Israel? You're free to do that. You're, you want to follow Christianity in Israel? You're free to do that. There is, there is no demarcation. Everybody is able to do everything. But it's peace. But you want to come and destroy us? Your main intention is evil? You want to kill us? No, no, no. I'm not going to tolerate that. We're going to take our stand. I mean, some of, some of you don't know. An idea of soldier is taught. If the terrorist does not have a weapon in his hand, 
you're not allowed to shoot them. Even if he's a terrorist. That's one of the disciplines of an IDF soldier. Are you with me? So, are we learning something? Okay, let's, let's go. So, so, so it says that he became frightful, fearful. Why did he become fearful? And then why did it change? If he's fearful, then why does it say that he detested the Jews? In the beginning I mentioned, when it describes the, uh, the Jews at first, it says, Vayagar, Moab, Pine Ha'am. It describes the Jewish people as Ha'am. Am. What is Am? Am? People. Am, who is a people who is Mi'od Ki Rav Hu. A people in whom there is a greatness, in whom there is a multitude. And then it says, via quotes Moab, Moab detested them. Now, there, there is a difference between being called Bene Israel, children of Israel, and being called Ha'am, people. What is Ha'am? Ha'am is basically Am Ha'aretz. Ha'am is basically earthly minded people. There are various uh, titles that Israel is given throughout in the Torah. They are called uh, Eda, Adat, Kahal, Am. Am, the people, is the lowest one you can call the people. Because Am is always Amaharans, earthly minded. You, you're, not, you're not thinking in the ways of God. You're just thinking, living like people. Nothing to do with God. Am means people, Goy means people, and in Hebrew, there are different names, basically. It, uh, Enosh, uh, uh, Anusim, Gever, Adam. Adam is the highest title uh, Israel is called, while the nations are called Anusim. Unless the Jewish people breaks ranks, the Torah calls them with a less, lesser title. So, uh, Am is basically the lowest. This is who he is. Not, not only if we look... Uh, I'm confused. I don't have num page numbers. Sorry. I keep changing my page. It's like a, a, a revolving sorry, door. This is what happens when you don't write page numbers. You know, you don't know where you are. The ethics of the father, Pirkei Avot, it says, and Ham Aretz, basically an earthly minded person, can never be a Khasid. Khasid meaning can never be a devoted one, cannot be a righteous one, because an earthly minded person cannot be pious. And you know what? They are right. If you are earthly minded, you are basically attracted to things in the world. So the Torah gives two different uh, uh, reactions. Here it says, Vayagar Moab Mipenem Ha'am. And when it calls them Ha'am, it says, Ki Rav Hu, that they were, these people have some kind of greatness in them. Now, the, the important word over there in greatness is the Hebrew word Rav. It is from the Hebrew word Rav we get the word Rabbi. Okay? Like, uh, for example, uh, in Hebrew, how do you say thank you? Toda. But if you are really, 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 it's not Toda, okay? <laughs> Don't mix it with Hindi. T-O-D-A-H, Toda. But if you are really, 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 really grateful, you will say Toda Raba. It is an exalted gratefulness that you are really, really grateful. Rav is where you get the word rabbi from. Why? Because rabbi is supposed to be one who is spiritually great, not physically great. Someone who is great in God's word. That's why you call him a rabbi. Because he knows God's word more than you. So it says, Mi paneha am. He sees the people has the greatness in them. In other words, their greatness doesn't come because of their number. Their greatness comes because of their inner quality. 
And their inner quality is not because they, uh, they, 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 they build muscles. Their inner quality, it comes basically from Hashem. Because of their relationship with God. Are you with me? And then it goes on to say, Why your quotes Moab, that Moab detested them, them as Bane Israel. In other words, what the Torah is saying here between these two distinct reactions and why it changes from Ha'am to Bene Israel is that basically the Torah is saying that if they were just Ha'am, if they were just people, no problem. Are you with me? I could fight people. Bal Bal Balak is saying I can fight people anytime, no problem. I can, I can even recruit my neighboring armies. I can go against the Jewish people. No problem. Why? Because they're just people. When you're just earthly minded people, anybody can destroy you. Okay? E even an enemy can destroy you. However, the Bible uses the word, Torah uses the word Ra. In other words, there is a greatness with inside of them. What is the greatness? The greatness is that they are Bene Israel. What is Bene? Bene is children or sons of Israel. What does it mean? What, what does Israel mean? The word Israel comes from two Hebrew words. It comes from one which is known Yasher. Yasher means upright and the second word is El meaning God. Yasher El. So Israel basically means one who is upright with God. Or else you can also say the upright ones. So if you call somebody upright ones, who, who are the upright ones? Who, in other words, Bene Israel, sons of the upright one. Who is the upright one? God, Hashem. In other words, if we are his sons, we're living according to him, not even the devil can do anything. I mean, just think about it. In other words, what the Torah is saying, why a Cuts, why a quotes Moab when he realizes that he can possibly take these guys and at that moment he realizes you know what I think I can take them but you know what in them you know what there is this greatness and you know what this greatness doesn't come from them that this greatness comes because they are children of the father in heaven therefore because he understood this greatness came from the father in heaven he detested them because he realized there is no way i can get around them forget it as much as i profess in the great and black magic i can't get around them you know why because they are children of israel their father is none other not not not, not anybody else but their father is hashem himself All powers must report to a higher hierarchy. Excuse me. Hashem is the greatest. He is the highest power of all powers. That means he even, he is the one who basically permits even the forces of darkness to exist. They are in his control. How do I know that? Isaiah says that because Isaiah says, Hashem says, I created good and evil. He created both. That means if Israel is on his good side, how can you get on his bad side? You know, that's why Paul says in the New Testament, in Galatians, in Ephesians, if you are in Christ, then you are what? You are the seed of Abraham. And if you are in the seed of Abraham, Technically, you become Israel. You become engrafted, like Romans chapter 11 talks about being engrafted. When you become engrafted, you're in his good side. When you're in his good side, nobody can basically do anything. Balak, Balak basically, in other words, Balak had a problem. What was his problem? His problem was he had a force he could not reckon with. And that force was none other than Hashem himself. However, there was this another guy who also had powers or better powers than him. And who was this other guy? It's Bilam. Balak realized that he could not take the Jewish people solely based on their numbers. Because, because if it was only number, if it was only physical numbers, you know what? I can take them. But if you see a force greater than you and you fear that force, you basically have two or three options. What is one? 
You, one option is you can try and make peace with them, become, become their friends as quickly as possible, or you can recruit your neighboring people and you can go to war or, and, and, and basically hit the fate of your own end very soon, or else forget about everything. I don't care. I'll just run into it. Let's see what happens. Last one you want to do? Be my guest. <laughs> However, the Bible says that he does none. Since he is a person of black magic and witchcraft, he's trying to investigate the spiritual window to try and see a weak point and try to see if I'm able to get these people somehow. He realizes that if they were just people, sometimes they will fall. You know, people as human beings, sometimes we fall in our lower ends. But in the Torah and in the Tanakh, the Jewish people are interchangeably called Jacob and Israel. You know about it, yes? Why, why are they called? Because some, they, they fluctuate. Sometimes they are Jacob, sometimes they are Israel. Many of times we are also like that. We, we, we walk in the ways of Jacob, sometimes we behave like Israel. Especially when we come Saturdays and Sundays, we are Israel. Monday to Friday, we are Jacob. I mean, I mean, you guys, you, you, we need to make a choice. We can't just, when we come to the synagogue, be Israel. We need to be Israel at all times. Why? Because we need to recognize that we have only one father. Our father is Hashem. He is the heavenly father. He is the greater power than any other power. And all powers on the earth in this nation will bow down to the superpower. Amen. However, there is this greatness in them. Rao. This means they derive their strength from their father in heaven. And they cannot be beaten. The question this morning I want to ask is, where do we derive our strength from? My education, my wealth, my family, my job, my bungalow, my car. I mean, really sad. Many of us, we, we, for us, we, we, we feel we are great only if we have this. Here in the wilderness, they have nothing. But here... Here is an, a king who is looking at the Jewish people and he's saying, you know what? I see a greatness in them. Not because of what they have. Their greatness is not because they were big in number. Their greatness is not because they won battles. Their greatness is because the one who is in them is greater than the, he that is in the world. So what, what happens? He says, I can't fight this battle. I need to go to plan B. And what was plan B? Let's call Bilam. Who is Bilam? He knew the right words. You look at the prayer. Let me go and ask Hashem. It really says that. He's not saying, let me go and ask your God. No, no. He said, let me go and ask Hashem. He knows the vocabulary. Just like Uncle Laban. He's acting as if I know God. He's in my pocket. I mean, this is amazing. Verse number 5 of, uh, of uh, chapter 22. He says that he sent messengers therefore to Bila Bilam, the son of Beor, to P Pitor, which is by the river to the lands, uh, of, uh, land of the sons of the people, to call him saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth and they are dwelling opposite me. Bilam comes in. God says, don't go. Then after some time, God says, go. This guy had an issue with his kamor, donkey. So he tries to curse them. He can't curse them. And finally, in the end, he, he says the famous prayer that we pray every time we enter into the synagogues. It's called Matobu. Matobu Oleka Yaakov Mishkunoteka Israel. How good are your tents, O Jacob? Your dwellings, O Israel. I mean, this is amazing. If you look at that scripture, he first calls them Jacob. Then he calls them Israel. So he recognizes that when they are down as Jacob, 
even then even when they are doing sin like Jacob even if they are like Hama Aretz earthly minded people God is still good to them are you with me when you are in Messiah even you're not walking fully with God you're still walking earthly minded God is still good with you he goes on to say Mishkunoteka it, the Mishkunoteka is Mishkan from the word Mishkan we get the word Shekinah Shekinah is the he we, we, it, it's the presence of God in other words because they are walking in the presence of God their dwelling is like the dwelling place of God so he learned Bilam learned here about the Jewish people that God deals with them a little bit different than the nations and this is why he said in his in in his prayer in the end Bilam said may my end be like theirs you know in one of his prophecies he said I see from within you arises a star and that star comes out of Jacob you know what he's basically saying he's basically talking about the Messiah 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 he's talking about Yeshua here in the book of numbers he's prophesying from out of you Yaakov comes out a star if you look at that whole liturgy the whole liturgy is not his words of Matovu it begins by his words it's only the first two verses we say but but the rest is basically the words of King David you know I really want to take time to talk about this this is really 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 powerful but I'm looking at the clock and I'm looking at your response I think I will keep it for some other time <laughs> but I want to close with this words of the Matovi listen to it know what you're praying every time you enter it says Matovu Oleka Yaakov Mishkunoteka Israel you know this is in the final part of his blessing this is when he gave up they went you remember they went to these three mountains and in all these mountains they they they, they built uh, 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 altars and the question is why in these three mountains they built seven altars why not three altars why not five altars why seven altars really important question we need to ask this is how you study God's word we don't we read it we don't we don't ask these questions that's why we never study so that's why people can read the whole Bible but have no understanding of it and then we don't grow spiritually growth only comes by education education of God's word here it says that how good are your tents O Jacob your dwelling places O Israel and later on after that the next part of it all comes from the words of King David it says Vani Bero Kasdeka Avo Verteka. It is through your abundant love that I may enter your home. Eshta Kav El Hekal Kodesh Kav Beir Ateka. I will bow in awe in the direction of your holy temple. What is the direction of the holy temple? Where is the holy temple? in Jerusalem so we bow towards Jerusalem not because we're worshiping Jerusalem because God said I will put my name in that place that's the only reason and by the way why 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 do we focus on Jerusalem because Yeshua says I'm going to come back on from where to the very place that he ascended from which was the place he ascended from he ascended from Mount of Olives and he said I'm going to come back to the Mount of Olives Mount of Olives is not in Maulali Mount of Olives is in Jerusalem hallelujah I mean you can understand that and by the way in English it is called Jerusalem but in Hebrew it is called Yerushalayim plural why because the the, the, the earthly Jerusalem corresponds with the heavenly Jerusalem Amen. then he goes on to say Adonai Havafti Meon Beteka Umekom Mishkan Kovadeka, Adonai, I love the temple, your home, 
and the place where your glory dwells wani estakav va ekrav a ekrav lefne adonai osi i will bow down low and prostrate myself before adonai my creator wani tafilati lakha adonai et ratson may my prayer find favor in your sight adonai elohim berov kazdeka aneni be amat ish eka in the abundance of your loving kindness answer me in the truth of your salvation do you know who composed this this prayer was composed by the men of the great assembly so you might ask who is the men of the great assembly ezra nehemiah all those kind of people they were responsible for 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 bringing out this liturgy this is the very liturgy that yeshua said when he entered into his synagogue every shabbat every time we say this we are doing what happened thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago we need to understand what is the theme of the matovu the theme of the motto is the shekina it is god's presence it's all about the shekina bilam is just the forerunner but the rest of the verses is all from king david amen here is a group of people if they are just the people any force can reckon them but they are a rav they are a greatness paul says rabbi shavul says we who were a wild olive branch have been taken in and grafted in and because we are grafted in through the messiah the same greatness they have has now become part of my greatness not because i am great because he is great hashem hashem no no force no force can reckon this friends if you want to bring down anybody you need to know the spiritual power behind that person but if we know the spiritual power behind us is not from earthly domain no earthly domain domain demons will have power over this earth heavenly domain it says in the book of hebrews like i said this morning to some of you hebrews one says that through yeshua god created the worlds alamot in other words worlds which you and i cannot see you're going through a difficult time in your life win the battle spiritually first allow god to be the greatness in you don't depend on your strength don't depend on our, your vocabulary don't depend on you, what you have that's why it says in the book of deuteronomy uh, uh, that that when 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 you're full and when you're satisfied do not forget as we close just think why did bilam want to curse the people no he basically wanted what the jewish people had he was selfish he wanted the money it was all about the money one of the reasons one of the comment commentators say is because he wanted to curse them was because of ayin hara evil eye what is evil eye 
yes it is stinginess but what is how 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 does ayin hara work in our world today yeah how does it work yeah how does coveting work it's for example Alan, Vinod and I are friends. We work in the same 9 to 5 job. Middle class. All of a sudden, they see me one day traveling on a Maserati. Is that what it is? Is, is there something like that? Yeah, okay. Because we, we used to work together and they, they didn't see that I hit the lottery. I didn't even tell them. All of a sudden, I'm flaunting my wealth around. All of a sudden, I don't walk in their level. I, I do stuff which they don't do. Now, what, what happens to them? Are they happy? Uh, this guy. I know this fellow. We used to have lunch. They know me in and out. They know all the bad things about me. Why? Because I'm flaunting my wealth. I'm causing unnecessary attraction. And their jealousy reaches the heavens. And it gives God concern and God sends his angels, prosecuting angels to come down. To check on me. What's the problem? He's flaunting his money. And this money is not even because he did anything. It's because I blessed him. And the best part is, I blessed him and he didn't even tithe of this money. I mean, funny, no? We, get, we buy new things, we don't think we need to tithe. Oh, why should I tithe? Like I always say, it is the what? Income we need to give? The gross. the gross. Not the monthly. It's easy to give the monthly. But tithe of everything. So Hashem sees my this one and He says, you know what? You're not doing what I'm asking you to do. The same way I became rich, the faster I became poor. What happened? Jealousy. Not because of anything, not, not because their jealousy affected me, it's because I'm not walking in the ways of God. That's what happens, friends. If you're walking in the ways of God, whatever the enemy does, because that's what Bilam found out. Bilam found out, you know what, no matter what, I can't curse these people, forget it. Every time I open my mouth to curse, it's just turning to blessing. You know, he, he's opening his mouth to curse. He has the words to curse. I curse. He's not curse. Is not. I bless you. I mean, I mean, this is amazing. Yeah, and Balak is saying, you know what? I want you to curse. No, no. How can I? Look at these fellows. Their dwelling is so beautiful. Their sand. Their 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 place is like the Shekinah of God. From them, because of their glory, there is a star that is rising. Friends, our life is not about us. Our life is about Hashem about God. I mean, so many things we can talk about, the three places they, they, they went to, the three mountains, the inner meanings, there's so much there. We don't have time. I wish we had a lot of time. But as we close this morning, I want us to look at our own lives and ask ourselves, where does our greatness come from? For everything we have, are we grateful back unto God? How, are we, how should we be grateful? By giving on back unto God. Why? Because the wealth we have, the money we have, everything we have is not ours. It belongs to Him. Am I willing to give back unto Hashem? If so, we will be Ben Israel. How God told Moses to tell Aaron to bless his children. And he said, I not only want to bless them, but I want to place my name upon them. And he said, Ivarekeka Adonai Ve Ishmireka. Ya er Adonai Panavaleka Vihuneka. 
Isa Adonai Panavale Kave Yashem Laka Shalom. The Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord will lift up his countenance upon you and establish you with his peace and with his shalom. Beshem Yeshua HaMashiach. Go and be blessed in the name of Yeshua and may we always live not only on Shabbat or on Sunday but every day of the week all days of our life as Bene Israel children of Israel and people who are upright with Hashem and walk as sons and daughters of the upright one. Amen. Amen.